It is, uh, good morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually stop beating on this piece of furniture and um, just hold my Bible. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> now, don't go too far. It holds my water. Our dear brother, first thing this morning, delivered to us good and thorough and accurate Bible exegesis. And it's very important that trained Christians continue to subject themselves to good exegesis. That is, let us see what does the scripture say about these various subjects. But I maintain that in order for biblical exegesis to be most effective, you have to be speaking to a largely biblically literate congregation. And when the congregation is in the word, when the congregation is reading the Bible, treating the Bible like a book should be treated, consuming it all, starting at one end and working one's way to the other end. <clears throat> then, especially then, the Bible verses on the topics all link together as they have done for our dear brother this morning. Now in American culture, following the fruits of a great spiritual revival, in fact it was that spiritual revival that brought the courage for us to have a revolution and throw off the tyranny of King George III and establish our own nation. That particular spiritual revival made the people, our public, biblically literate. They were reading the scriptures. They treasured the scriptures. They taught their children to read from the scriptures. So when they came together for church, their ministers were able to simply remind them of the scriptures relevant to whatever the subject was. And it is quite effective in a congregation of disciples to remind them, pick a subject, whatever the subject might be, and then do thorough Bible exegesis. So what does the Bible say about this subject? And then you thoroughly cross-reference and you sew it all together, but it's sewn in context to individuals and to a congregation that know the whole big picture. The problem in modern Christianity in America, and I suspect it's also true everywhere else around the world, the problem is people are no longer biblically literate and therefore the sermons of preachers giving an isolated verse here, an isolated verse there, are not understood in context. Context becomes possible when you know the whole book, when you've made it your business to know what God has said. Divine revelation. Let me ask you this question. Do you know how God, who happens to be triune, if I haven't mentioned that already, I would figure I'd mention it again. How does this triune God primarily reveal himself to humanity? Well, number one, he reveals himself by creation. God speaks through creation. 
There is order. There must be an orderer. There's design. There must be a designer. There is beauty. Then there must be an artist behind it all. Creation speaks to us. God reveals himself through creation. There are things that you can know about God as you see it portrayed in an earthly father, also in an earthly mother. But creation will not tell you his name. Creation will not tell you how to know him or how to be saved. There's only enough divine revelation in creation to provoke you to want more. Number two, God speaks to us through conscience. God reveals to us some truth by conscience. That is to say, truth is written on our heart. So much so that we have the capacity to hear something and know that it is the truth even if we don't want it to be the truth. Like the indictment that we are sinners or that our actions are wrong even though we want to do them. Conscience speaks. God reveals himself by the amount of truth that he wrote on our heart in our conscience. But just like creation, conscience is only enough to provoke you to want to know more. But what is the name of this lawgiver? What is the plan? What's the will? Why did he create me? Why am I here? Where am I going? What is my purpose for existing? And for all of that, ladies and gentlemen, the God who has revealed himself in a small way by creation, the God who has revealed himself in a small way by conscience, reveals himself much more thoroughly when he texted us. And he continues to text us. God has texted you. And he delivered this integrated message system to you and me through the covenant people, Israel, through his chosen people, Israel. We owe them an enormous debt. We need to recognize that enormous debt. And by the way, New Testament, the Apostle Paul in Romans makes it abundantly clear that none of us Gentile believers should ever be guilty of boasting ourselves against the original branches that were pruned off and we were grafted in. And Paul says they were pruned, they were cut off because of unbelief. The same God who was able to graft in unnatural branches to that tree is able to restore them to that tree. Those branches that were cut off. There is in Christianity much boasting against the branches in this modern age. I just want to say to you, on a way to making another point, <laughs> there is no nation on earth that is sinless. We are all sinners, and we are made of nations of sinners. But in the current conflict, at the center of the world's attention, there is a nation that deserves your support and your defense, and that is the nation of Israel, as they are surrounded by their Muslim enemies who want to destroy them. And they seek only to defend themselves. And all of the numbers that are coming out of Gaza 
are being made up by Muslim liars. Following the teachings of their false prophet Muhammad, lying is acceptable. And their agents, like the Communist News Network, all of their willing agents in the mass media, one of my Israeli friends calls them the media knights. <clears throat> They pass on the lies and silly, undiscerning people believe their lies. Just for the record, they gave us a number of 30,000 civilian deaths on Gaza's side. First of all, it's a lie. Included in that 30,000 are 15,000 terrorists. They're counting them as civilians, they're not civilians, they're part of a terrorist army. Additionally, the sad reality is they, the terrorists, hide behind civilians so that the civilians will be killed and they can then blame Israel, whom they are at war with. So know the truth and don't be fooled. But listen to me, the, the real danger is within Christianity of those who have attempted to twist the scripture to come up with an, a replacement theology. God has done with those people that all of the promises that God made have passed to the church. This is not true. Not true. As a matter of fact, I maintain the only way for anybody to believe that is for them to hop and skip around through the scripture rather than dealing with the book as a whole. Now, my Calvinist friends, you happen to be a Calvinist here, God bless you, you're my brother. But I am not a Calvinist. I cannot be. For I deal with the Bible as a whole. I don't deal with Calvin's favorite verses. I deal with this book as a whole. And if you deal with this book as a whole, hmm, you must acknowledge that God has yet a future plan for the salvation of Israel. That God has a plan, and that Messiah, who was in fact rejected by them at his first coming, will be received by them at his second coming. They will, according to the prophet Zechariah, ask him where he received his wounds. And he'll inform them in the house of my friends or my family, my kin. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only begotten. This is a reality that if you keep the Bible as a whole, you will not be fooled, nor will you be in error. That was my introduction, and I've got 31 minutes left. Genesis chapter 3. We left off with, God had pronounced a curse against the serpent. He went beyond the serpent to the entity that used the serpent, Satan, who was once Lucifer, who is the father of lies, who is the author of evolution. The concept is his invention. He convinced himself of it. His five I will statements from Isaiah 14 reveal that he invented the very notion that is now the core of every false religion on earth. And I say to you again what I said, I believe, uh, two days ago, that all of the false Christs only ascend. The true Christ, he descended. The true Christ, he came down from heaven. He was no man that worked his way up into divinity. He is God in human form. He is God who added humanity to his divinity. Now this, I want to point out to you. Jesus Christ 
is who the Bible is about. And from the very beginning, he is in Genesis chapter 1, creating. He is the creator. He is part of the let us make man in our image within the counsel of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Christ is central. He is the one who created. He is, in fact, I maintain, the very logos, the very word of God that even Adam and Eve interacted with. The voice of the Lord God that walked with them in the cool of the day. The very voice of the Lord that they hid themselves from. Genesis 3.15 gives to us in a singular masculine pronoun the very first promise of Christ. Now, the word Christ, you guys understand, it's a title. Christ is not his last name. It's not his surname. He is Yeshua, Jesus, as we say, Christ, Messiah. What does that term actually mean? Well, some would define it as the chosen one or the anointed one. This is accurate. Ultimately, the term Christ, it means the one. The one. And the very first mention of the one was right there in that 15th verse. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel crush his heel do you have this picture of a conqueror who stomps the head of the serpent so severely that he bruised his heel in the process What happens to the head of, of a serpent when the conqueror stomps him so hard that he breaks his heel? The serpent is destroyed. So now we go from Genesis 3.15 to Genesis 3.16. Look there with me. And God said unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. Now, this was not God saying to Eve or to all of Eve's daughters. This was not God saying, this is how I will now punish you. It was not punishment. It was just simply consequence. God said, you are made in a certain way. And now the way you are made is a guarantee for sorrow. A guarantee for pain. Many of our modern English translations instead of sorrow, give us the word pain. Please allow me to point out to you that God used that word twice in speaking to Eve. God used the word twice, sorrow, the word twice. That in conception and bringing forth life, you will have pain, even sorrow. And in pain or sorrow, you'll bring forth children. And your desire shall be to your husband. What does that mean? What does that mean? Your desire shall be to your husband. Let me put it this way. God was informing his creature, his creature Eve, his creation. He was informing her. 
that she has a deep need that he created her with. That deep need to know that she is loved is going to become the source of her pain and it will be the very thing that puts her at a disadvantage. All through her life, her desire shall be to her husband. I submit to you, my dear sisters, who who are single, that your desire is to your husband when you don't even have one yet. The longing in your heart and connected to that longing and hope is also a fear. A fear that you might never be so loved as you dream that you will be. There are three, there's a lot of threes. There's a lot of threes in a universe created by a triune God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. His triunity is reflected in every direction. Listen to me. Number one, you want to know the reason why women suffer more than men? You want to know the reason why it is a hard world to live in under the effects of sin, under the effects of the curse. And it's harder if you're a woman. I say this as a man. And I say this as a pastor of decades a lifelong ministry to my fellow humans has caused me to see in the scripture that there are three plain reasons why you hurt more. I want every man in this room to hear what I'm saying to the women in this room. Number one, you are the weaker vessel. You are physically weaker. And again, I cite 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. The married apostle tells us that a man is obligated to live in an understanding way. He is to live with his wife according to knowledge. King James Version. According to knowledge. There's a few things you need to know if you're going to live and share your life with your wife. Peter is not just saying dwell together like in the same house. He is saying live together, share your life together with your wife in an understanding way according to knowledge. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. I said before, I'll say again to you right now, weaker does not mean inferior. Weaker just means delicate. A weaker vessel, delicate vessel, this is not delicate. That vessel can take that kind of abuse and not fail. Now, you know there are other vessels that, if I did that to it, would shatter. Now, does that mean that those other vessels are inferior to that cheap plastic? No, certainly not. Not inferior. In fact, probably much more valuable. Woman... You are a weaker vessel, and you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be easily broken. You're supposed to be delicate. You are like a flower. Men are a tree. You're flowers. Delicate. Easily broken. Precious, beautiful but not to be treated harshly. So number one, you are the weaker vessel, and you will be broken a lot. You have been broken so much. 
Number two, not only are you the weaker vessel, not only are you physically weaker, you are emotionally deeper. You are so much deeper than us men. Men have big muscles, or at least we're supposed to. And we should work for those. They're not for show. They're for serving. They're not for abusing your wife. They are for protecting your wife. They are for doing the heavy lifting. I have seen an appalling tradition in Africa, in those towns where there's no infrastructure and it is the women who carry the burdens and the, the men who use their muscle to whip the women into carrying the burdens. This is tyranny. This is not the way of the Lord. And, and, and those, those cultures, those towns, they will act like that's women's work, carrying those heavy loads. I have seen and been very disgusted at the sight of men in the shade of a tent in the bush, sipping tea, while women walk by with baskets and bundles. That's not how this is supposed to work. This is the sad consequence of sin entering the picture. Dear lady, you should know, in case nobody has told you, perhaps you've wondered, what is wrong with your man? Does he have no feelings? The answer is he has feelings, but they're little. And it's not just him. It's all of us, us men. It would seem that when God did the division, he reversed the whole ratio that exists with regard to muscle, physically. Men have the big muscles, women have the little muscles. Women have the big feelings, enormous feelings. Men have little feelings, which makes it all the more pathetic if you're a man and you live at the mercy of your little tiny feelings. If you live at the mercy and obedience to your little tiny feelings as a man, you are a boy. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> it's worth remembering. What does a boy do? A little baby boy only announces his feelings. That's all he knows. They're the biggest things in his world, his feelings and his wants. But there is a point in his journey where he needs to leave that behind and stop obsessing over what he feels and what he wants and start focusing on what others need. Yeah, what needs to be done. For a man, it is not a question what do you feel like? As a man, I don't care how you feel. You should not care how I feel about how you feel. <laughs> it is irrelevant. What matters is what do you know? What is true? That's what matters. I will tell you I have a different perspective with regard to my sisters. I have a completely different perspective and I understand you feel and God made you to feel. Feel on. <laughs> but at the same time, dear sister, as our brother preached this morning, you must remember the just shall live by faith. By faith, that means even the women, that means even those whose feelings are enormous must live by what they know. My dear sisters, 
you should know that the biggest feeling any man has, the only one that is big, is anger. Because we're supposed to fight wars. So the Lord left us big giant anger so we could fight those wars, so we could be zealous on behalf of our family, so we could be zealous and protecting our wife and our children. My sisters, you hurt more because you are weaker vessel. You are physically weaker. You are emotionally deeper. You've got to know that. I don't, listen, ladies, there's something you need to know that men have that you do not have. A man has what I like to refer to as an oh well switch, where his heart can be breaking about something, but he can shut that off. There's a switch, and he can go, I can't do anything about it, oh well. There's a danger for a man that if his switch gets stuck on, oh well, he's messed up and he's not like the Lord at all. But as we deal with life, as we deal with tragedies, as we deal with human suffering, as a man, you have to have the capacity to stop your heartbreaking and go on to do what has to be done. I'm just saying, I'm not suggesting that women don't do that. They have to. Certainly mothers have to. They just carry on. They press on. But I'm saying to you that the man has it easier when it comes to turning it off, that a man can choose. I'm going to stop being sad about that. I can't be sad about that right now. I can't stay there mourning that loss. There are things that must be done. And it's easier for a man whose feelings are much smaller to flip the switch. There's an interesting and little known reality that has been observed by the sociologist that what the modern world of warfare refers to as uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or in the old wars, they would call it shell shock. But the dysfunction and the ongoing future suffering that is the result of past trauma for a man is proven to be in direct proportion to the lack of an understanding of the righteousness of the cause. I don't know if you understood what I just said. But if a man understands the purpose and the mission, that he is fighting for something true, that he's fighting for something that is right, that his cause is righteous, then such a man may see horrors, but not spend the rest of his life ruined by those horrors. Conversely, in the modern age of warfare, where men are just sent, or now men and women, sent to go to war without a clear understanding of the purpose, how is it relevant to my people that I'm to protect? Without that, there is great damage that is being done. Men have the capacity to cease feeling. Ladies, you don't know this. Many of you, you can't relate to that. You can't imagine. You wish you could. Your hearts will go on breaking and, and will continue to break. And you can see that a man doesn't have that. And it's true. You are, my dear sisters, much deeper emotionally. But there's a third reason, and I stated it already. Third reason, you are wired with a need to know that you are loved. That need to know that you are loved is real. 
and you were born with it. And God gave that to you. And it is the same God, the same creator, who then commands the Christian husband. Husband, you love your wife as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for it. Then he might present her to himself. Oh, my brothers, every single man needs to understand, if you're married, when you complain about your wife, you are indicting yourself. For she is the fruit of your ministry. Either she is thriving because she is loved by you, or she is withering because of your failure to love her and to convince her by your actions, not your mere words, or your words are important. You should certainly tell her that you love her. You should certainly express to her that she's beautiful, that she's valuable, that you should express to her how proud you are of her hard work and her courage, her virtue, her humility, her care for other people. By the way, let me just tell you something. But, uh, some of you don't know this. Some of you men think the only way to change somebody is to tell them what's wrong with them. And some of you as fathers, you think the only way to affect your children is to reprove them and rebuke them, to tell them what they're doing when it's wrong. We have an obligation to do that, but if that's the only thing you do, you are a terrible father. And you probably learned that type of fathering from a terrible father. And now you're being just like him. A family tradition of terrible fathers who only ever speak to their son or their daughter or their wife to inform them of their wrong, to inform them of how they have fallen short of your expectation. And you don't know the power of a commendation. You don't know the power of a compliment. You don't know the power of praise. I urge everyone in this room, but especially you men, study Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the seven letters from Christ to seven churches. Of those seven churches, five of them hear from Christ what's wrong with them. But they hear that after he tells them what is right with them. He starts with who he is to say what he's about to say. And then he says, I know your works. And he commends them. And then for five of them, he will have to follow that with, nevertheless, I have something against you. And he tells them what it is, and he tells them what to do about it. Of the seven churches, one of those churches receives no reproof at all. There's nothing wrong with them. They receive only commendation, only praise. Are you listening to me? One of those churches receives no Criticism at all from Christ. One of those churches receives no praise at all. Only criticism. This should be a lesson to you and me as fathers and as husbands. Is there a time to speak directly to the wrong that somebody may be doing? Of course. But if that's all you ever do, you frustrate your children. Do you not know the Ephesians chapter 5 addresses us fathers and says, Fathers, 
Provoke not your children to wrath. Don't frustrate them, but bring them up, okay? You can't send them up. You have to bring them up. Do you guys get that? Real leadership is not from behind, driving somebody for the whip. Real leadership is pulling, not pushing. Do you hear me, men? Real leadership is pulling. You say to your son, come. You say to your daughter, come with me. You bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. All right, I've gotten off my subject. I'll go back to it now. If you are a husband and you have nothing but complaints about your wife, you are indicting yourself because she is what you describe that way because of you, because you make her that way. You are either leading her in such a way as to make her grow and to make her worthy of praise, or you're just crushing her. Uh, and there are times there's so much in my heart, in my head, that's all trying to come out at one time. A woman is by God's design. Listen, a woman is a responder. By the very design of God, she is given this need to know that she's loved and she responds to love or the lack of love. She responds to kindness and she will respond to commendation and to praise. Do you have a daughter? Brother, if you have a daughter, you may, if you observe it to be so, want to commend her that she's a beautiful daughter. But if you do that, and you do that too much, she will get a message from you that that's what matters. She'll get the wrong message that that's what matters and that that's what's really important. And the thing that you compliment, the thing that you praise will be the thing that she tries hardest at. So stop going on and on about how pretty your daughter is. I'm not saying don't tell her she's pretty, but make the emphasis her character. You see wisdom, you commend wisdom. Commend her intelligence. Commend her wisdom. Commend those virtues that you see. You see hard work, praise that hard work. You see discernment that your daughter is not stupid and she's not played. You see that, you commend that. You make sure that she knows that you have observed that and that makes you proud. Do the same with your wife, I'm telling you. Your wife has a need. God put that need there. And you who are single, you better be listening to me right now, mister. Because what I'm giving you is the truth. That the design of God with the heart of a woman has made her in such a way that she needs to know she is loved. Why? Because she plays the part of the church in the relationship that marriage is actually all about. And the church is a responder to the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith. The one who initiated. Do you guys get that? None of us in this room are Christians because we went looking for God. I don't know if it is said here, but it's frequently said in America by professing Christians that everything changed when they found the Lord. 
like he was lost. And they found him. He was never lost. The only reason any of us love Christ, even to the degree that we do, even though we know we don't love him like he's worthy. The only reason we love him is because he loved us first. The church is the responder to the love of God, to the grace of that glorious gospel. The church loves because he loved us first. We spoke last night about that tree, that forbidden tree. Where was it? In the midst of the garden. That tree was an opportunity for Adam to love God. That tree was an opportunity for Adam to demonstrate his love and his trust. God did not create this arrangement to find out. God already knew that free will, that free moral agency would result in sin and that mankind would be estranged and would need a savior. The plan to save us is before the foundation of the earth. You're all clear on this, right? The plan to save us is older than the world. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundations of the earth. <laughs> Do you understand that the whole arrangement, now some look at it as entrapment. Some are angry at God. There are some who actually think that the whole arrangement was cruel, that God put a man in a garden and gave him something he couldn't have, put it right there in front of him. There are people shaking their bony little fists at God as if that was unfair. They have missed the point. The whole arrangement, even giving us free will, so that he might love us unilaterally. He might demonstrate to us unmerited, undeserved, unearned love that wins our hearts. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Okay, men, I don't think you're hearing me. Husbands, those who desire to be husbands, you need to understand that God made you different because you play the part of Christ in this relationship that we are focused on. You play the part of the initiator. You either initiate love by loving your wife and presenting her to yourself or you don't. You're supposed to be the initiator. You were made by God, wired by God, different. Mm. The woman is wired with a deep need and under the effects of sin, the way God created her, she will hurt much more deeply and she will suffer more. And I maintain if we'll get into Genesis chapter 3, 17, God uses the same word to Adam once. Brothers, is life hard for us on a sin-cursed world? Yes, it is. Life is hard for us, but it is worse for them. Brother, stop your whining. Stop being a boy. Man up and leave that whining behind. You put away childish things. You and I, brother, need to become others-centered. Others-centered. And become conscious of the plight of the world around us, and particularly 
all the brokenhearted women. And we start with those nearest to us, our own. And then with all purity, we go beyond that. The Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 5, he, uh, he gives some very practical words to young Pastor Tim. And he tells Timothy, don't rebuke an older man harshly, but appeal to him and treat him as a father. You want to be effective with an older man? Maybe that older man is doing something wrong. Tailor your message. Tailor your presentation in such a way that he can receive it. He goes from that to say to Timothy, treat all the younger men like your brother, not your slave, not your underling. Treat them as your brother. Treat, he uses the same verb, all of the older women as your mother. You talk to her like she's your mother. You, your physical gesture should be of a son toward his mother. All your actions should be as your son and she is your mother respectfully. And then he says to young Pastor Tim, treat all the younger women as your sisters in absolute purity. Absolute purity. There is no room for carnal, manipulative, sloppy agape. There are men in this meeting perhaps now, there have been men in this meeting that I have heard about who are, I guess the word is, creeping the ladies out. If you are creeping the ladies out, you're going to get talked to here by the leadership of this church who recognize you are behaving in a way toward women that is predatory. If it hasn't happened yet, expect it to happen today. We know who you are and we will find you. <laughs> you sleazy, creepy. Little punks. You know who you are. We are commanded, just as Paul was commanded by, just as Timothy was commanded by Paul, Paul speaking by the Holy Spirit, advising young Pastor Timothy, listen to me, men. Listen to me, men. Same Spirit of God speaks to you and me. Maybe you're not as young as Pastor Tim was. Maybe you're old like me. <laughs> was reminded of my old age by a little guy just the other day. When I said to him, what are you going to be when you grow up? Little Manning said, whatever God wants. I go, well, what's, what's that mean? He goes, I don't know. I go, well, let me tell you what you're going to be. I do this all the time. You're going to be a man. He's like, oh, yeah, well, I didn't know that. He goes, what else? I go, well, you're going to be a godly man. <laughs> and he's looking at this old white-haired man. And he wanted to say something nice back. But as far as he could tell, I did not have a future <laughs> on earth. <laughs> so he said to me, and you're going to have a great time in heaven. Clearly, from his perspective, that could happen any second, any minute. <laughs> if you're an old man like me, although our senior, who started the day, he's got 20 years on me, and he gives me great encouragement. I was blessed this morning by your presentation, the sweetness of it. That humbles me. It's the Holy Spirit, the humility of it. You and I were all spoken to by a father. You want to be that kind. That's the kind you want to be. Treat all the women 
as if they were your mother or your sister, unless you have white hair, and they can treat them as if they are your daughter. And you add that, that the Spirit of God added, with all purity. For there are those who will act like they're being fatherly while they're actually just manipulating a younger woman. Uh, All right, so I've gone over. Forgive me, let's just review this. Women, my dear sisters, you hurt, you suffer. Life is hard, but it's worse for you as daughters of Eve than it is for sons of Adam. And it's not because this is some kind of justice. This is not God saying, yeah, suffer. What God was saying to Eve, I bet he said it with a cry in his voice. I bet he said it in the same way that the Son of God dealt with women in all four Gospels, coming to the rescue, coming to the rescue of that Samaritan lady at the well in John chapter 4, coming to the rescue of that woman caught in the act of adultery in John chapter 8, coming to the rescue of that woman in Luke chapter 7 who had the reputation in that town that she was a sinner. He rescued her. He loved her so much. It made her cry a foot bath. There is no place in any of the four gospels where there is a man washing the Lord's feet with his tears and then drying his feet with his beard. (laughs) That depth of love is a response to the great love that was shown by Christ. That should be a challenge to every man among us to be that kind of man. All right, stand with me, please, Josh. Let's just do a quick prayer about all of this. Please let me pray for you. Our Father, one who sent his Son, Lord Jesus, man of all men, God-man, Spirit of God, who is given to change us. I pray for every man standing right now. I pray for every man in this room that you would please break through our stupidity (laughs) and show us what we're supposed to be, how we are supposed to be. Open our eyes to these things. In the name of Christ, may we, like you, you in us, come to the rescue of the hurting world around us. Father, I pray for every single woman in this room now, will you please speak to her, answer her heart, meet her where she is in her great hurt. Everybody keep praying for a moment. Just stay prayerful. My my question right now is to you ladies. I'm asking you, as a brother, as a father, if your heart is so very broken that you really do feel that you are crushed, that the disappointments and the abuse of life have taken such a toll that you wonder at times if God even really does love you, you fear that he does not. If that crippling fear is part of your life, please put your hand up. Put your hand up because I want to pray for you. Oh, God bless you, lady. I'm asking you, if you are a woman and you acknowledge this morning that your heart is broken and you want it to heal, if you are a woman and you're acknowledging this morning your need for healing, put your hand up. Just hold it for a minute. Hold it up there. 
Oh, Lord Jesus, you see them. Father, you see my sisters. Meet them where they are. And reveal to them your great power to heal. That you are the lover of our soul. That you're the one who is able to pick up all these broken pieces that have been left by men and the cruelty of men. Most of the pain in most of the hearts of the women in this room, that pain has come from men, not women. And I ask you, Lord, to reveal yourself to those who raise their hands and to every one of us as the one man that will never do us wrong. In the name of Christ, reveal yourself to be that one who will heal and only do right. In the name of Christ, be their hero. I pray it, Lord. I pray it in the name of Christ. Amen. I got to tell you one more thing. I got to tell you something. <clears throat> when I was a boy and I was really small, after my father had thrown away his family, I was preyed upon. I was preyed upon by a man, a pervert, a homosexual. I didn't even know what that was. And that man pretended to be a father. He pretended to care about me and the other fatherless boys. He treated us like we were special. We had no idea we were being groomed for a camping trip that he invited us all on when the school year was over. The discovery of what was actually happening, what, was, what this was all about, was at that time a great wound in my soul. Made me angry, made me bitter and distrusting, made me dangerous. I was a dangerous little boy, even though I was too small to be dangerous. I was committed, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to get bigger, and I'm going to be really, really dangerous. And that... That wound put me on a course that had the Lord Jesus himself not interrupted it and healed my heart. I would not be anybody you'd like today. I wouldn't even know you. You wouldn't know me and you wouldn't want to know me. But what he, what he did to my heart, healing me, has allowed me to come to the rescue of many other men and women. And I, I actually have to acknowledge that the one who watched from heaven and was involved in my story allowed me at least that much of a wound and that much suffering so that I can identify with you. I know that sounds strange, but I actually can identify with women in this room. Is that weird? Oh, well still true. And if you will look to the Lord, if you will allow him to heal you, if you allow him to reveal himself to you, you will not live as a victim of what those men did to you. And may it be so, for he loves you so much. Don't let those who have wronged you continue to exercise that kind of power over your life. Let him set you free. Amen.